je staat daar al bij voren in de kunstzaal. Staat je passion al bij voren in de kunstzaal. Hi everyone, welcome to part two. So in this part, I'm going to talk you through the actual conceptualization and measurement process uh, with respect to social class. And then we're going to finish by looking at how we evaluate measures. And the evaluation part is important because this is going to introduce some important principles that we are going to use to assess um, research under other headings, for example, survey research or interview research. So we're going to talk about validity and we're going to talk about reliability. Um, again, in the sense in which we're going to talk them today um, is predominantly with respect to quantitative research, the design of survey questions. Um, we do talk about validity, of course, in qualitative research, but we tend to use different evaluation criteria to assess the quality um, of qualitative questioning. Um, we don't tend to apply as formal approach as we will, as you'll see in this session. So just to be aware, or just be aware that some of what, quite, quite a bit of what we do today is quite particular or specific to survey research or quantitative research. So in part one, I talked about conceptualization and measurement as a process. Before we can study something, we need to define it. And before we can ask people questions about something, we need to be sure or confident at least that the questions we're asking them are going to capture the phenomenon that we're interested in measuring. Now, this process involves uh, several interrelated stages. As with any piece of research, any study, we always need to start with theory. You see this box over here on the left. So theory is, as we said, or as we tried to define in week two, um, is any sort of systematic or coherent body of ideas, generally built from previous research, but also built from other contributors like philosophy and so on. Um, and generally the way this works in, 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 a, in an applied research setting is that we use theory um, and past literature to build research questions and to identify key variables. So in a moment, the example that we're going to look at is social class, and I'll talk a little bit more specifically about how we use theory there. And there are different kinds of theory, and um, theory can be quite abstract in the sense that there are kind of bodies of theory that talk in a very general sense about how societies work, about how crime works, about the nature of criminality and deviance and so on. And then there are more specific theories, what we might refer to as middle range theories, that talk more specifically about how social class works as a determinant of life chances or a probability of recidivism and so on. So we tend to distinguish in social research between what we might call abstract or grand theories, the sort of big picture theories that try to explain um, in a very broad sense how society works, and the more middle range theories that we draw on quite often in criminology to explain how one particular aspect of the social world works. So theory always informs the scope, aims and objectives, but it also helps us identify key variables. What are the key properties that might be relevant to this study? So if we're looking at um, determinants of local crime rates, for example, theory might tell us that some of the key variables there will be things like the relative affluence or deprivation of an area. It will be to do with things like the density of um, different mixes of housing tenure, and something to do perhaps with the history of the area, the socioeconomic profile of the area, employment rates and so on. And so uh, when we're trying to define all of these different properties that are going to be a part of our study, what we're doing is we're conceptualizing. And the second box here deals with concepts. So conceptualization involves defining abstract concepts in terms that allow us to measure them. And the question we're asking here, as I said, is not that we're looking for a definition in the sense of a dictionary definition, but we're looking for a definition based on existing knowledge, based on existing theory that allows us or that points towards questions we might ask and sort of what I, what I call here empirically observable components of the concept. So if I was trying to measure somebody's social class, what kinds of question would I ask to give me an indicator of that? What are the empirically observable components of that? When we start thinking in these more sort of concrete terms, we're moving to stage three, which is operationalization. This is where we're taking the concept and we're trying to translate it into questions. What specific questions can I ask? We refer to these as indicators as well. What are the indicators of the concept? In social class, it's things like employment status, um, it can be also income as well when we deal with sort of other um, more broad based definitions of social class. But this when we start thinking in these again, more progressively concrete terms, what we're doing is we're thinking of indicators. So you're probably noticing the terminology in a lot of this is quite dense. And again, in survey research, we need to be careful with our terminology 
because again the goal of this is that we're able to you know disclose in detail and with accuracy all of the decisions and sort of thought processes that have gone into selecting the questions that we use so the terminology is quite important because we need to be able to communicate our findings clearly so when we talk about the conceptualization stage when we talk about indicators we need the terminology so that we can communicate specifically to other readers what it is we're actually doing and attempting to do so indicators are not just questions they're not just survey questions they can be things that are recorded through questions or they can be measured from the properties of social groups using secondary data sources so an indicator of the affluence of an area um, might be we might go to the census perhaps and we could look at geographical statistics and we could look at the employment rate we could look at the average income we could look at there are deprivation measures that we'll be looking at in a couple of weeks that operate at a geographical level and these could be indicators um, of things like affluence and so on and then finally uh, the penultimate stage then for a survey researcher is to generate questions so we need questions to measure our concepts so once we've gone through from you know part one where we've got the theory where we're thinking about it to conceptualizing it, defining it, to operationalizing it, coming up with questions. What we want to end up with in the end um, is a set of questions that we can use to gather information on that concept. And what we're looking for essentially is valid and reliable indicators. So how this works is, if you can imagine for a moment the concept of social class, um, I'm gonna get you to do an exercise on this in the, uh, in the lecture on Monday. So if you're watching this either on a Friday or a Monday, um, We'll be doing this at the 1 p.m. session. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be doing a little bit more on this. So if you look at the diagram in front of you, um, what you're looking at is an example of how the conceptualization process might work with respect to a concept like social class. So intuitively, uh, the reason I've chosen this is because most of us understand, at least in an elementary or, or, an, or an intuitive way, what social class means. Social class generally points towards some kind of hierarchy. And when we think of social class, we tend to think quite often of two things. We tend to think of income and we tend to think of occupation. So the way that societies are stratified, um, at least in our sort of popular imagination, is that people are divided on the basis of income. We can grade people. Some people have lots of money, some people have little money, lots of wealth, less wealth and so on. And also occupation. So some people are higher professionals like doctors and lawyers and so on. And some people work in manual professions or what was, would have been char uncharitably termed unskilled professions or uh, manual professions many years ago. And so obviously none of these indicators on their own are particularly useful. So if we're thinking about social class from a criminological perspective, what are the components of social class that we might, and in other words, if you look at these six branches that are branching off from social class, what we're doing here is we're trying to think of indicators for this concept. We're thinking what are the components of the concept, but also what might the potential indicators be? What might we measure or what would we ask people to get um, to get a valid sort of picture of their social class? And social class can be several different things. It can also include, just to give you a quick sort of snapshot overview of the evolution of this, um, <clears throat> when governments and the state first started measuring, including measures of social class, this goes all the way back to the early uh, United Kingdom Register General's um, social class frameworks, they would typically ask people things like their occupation. And to a large extent, we still do this. The UK census still does this, and we'll show, I'll show you this in a minute. And they ask people their occupation, but they ask them things about their occupation. Uh, what's the skill level of your job? We can categorize people based on the type of job they do into sort of grades of profession, whether it's higher professions, manual, managerial, and so on. But they tend to ask people um, questions that get at whether they work in a service role or whether they work in a management role. Do they work for somebody or do they work um, or are they in charge of people? And then they ask other things like the size of the organization and of course income is important as well. But there are other dimensions to social class also. Um, social class is not just occupation, it can be also things like prestige, the way that we differentiate between um, individuals and our peers is it can be sometimes on the basis of consumption does somebody do people own expensive objects um, are they friends with particularly influential or powerful people um, an example of the social capital component of social class would be something like um, instagram influencers so for example you could be working as a brand ambassador perhaps you're not earning a lot of money perhaps you are but there is a prestige component to that that gives you um, that gives you certain power but that also sets you apart 
So these are things that we refer to in criminology and sociology as social capital, uh, sort of intangible resources that you can draw on. Um, and often these can translate into material resources. If someone has high social capital in the form of political connections, then that can often translate into reward. Um, we see this in the case of uh, lobbying in the United States is a good example. Um, corporations or managers with contacts in the political sphere can use their social capital to leverage greater income, greater control and so on. So again, th this could obviously take a very long time and there are you know, entire sociology modules on the concept of social class. So it's many, many different things. But if we think about it from uh, the point of view of how it's measured in official sources like the census, this is with reference to the UK census. So theory tells us that social class is principally about stratification. So social class is a way of dividing people into grades or hierarchies based on certain criteria. And the concept usually consists primarily of things like occupational hierarchy. So what job does somebody do? What's their status within that job? Also things like education, um, social networks, but also and things like cultural capital, like we talked about in the previous one. Now, the indicators that tend to be used in uh, current measures of social class are things like um, the service role, so whether someone is in a managerial or a service role, but also the sector of employment, so what sector they work in, whether it's finance, agriculture, construction, and so on. Do they work for a large organization, a small organization? And then the question that's asked, how this translates into a question then, is by asking what the firm or organization you work for mainly made or did at the place where you work. It's one of the questions that feeds into the NS SEC. So this is the National System for Socioeconomic Classification. There's a five class model and there's an eight class model. And it looks something like this. So when you break it down into the five class model, um, you essentially end up with five different classes. So at the top are the managerial and professional occupations. And the second group are intermediate. The third, small employers and own account workers. Fourth, lower supervisory and technical. And five, semi-routine and routine occupations. And you can see a breakdown here for um, the territories of the United Kingdom and also the total, so all four combined. This is from the British Household Panel Survey. It's unweighted as well, so this obviously isn't the true representation of the different um, of the different proportions. So this is one way of dividing people on the basis primarily of occupation and um, employment, employer size. Now we need some way to evaluate this. Um, for any given measure, we always need to question whether the measure is valid or reliable. When we ask questions of validity, what we're asking is, does the measure actually measure what it sets out to? And this is going to point towards something that we're going to spend a bit of time on next week, which is the clarity of a question's phrasing and the clarity of the question's response options. So in order for a question to be valid, um, it has to be conceptualized thoroughly. Um, it doesn't just have to be written in sort of an you know, elegant or a simplistic way. Um, it has to be conceptually valid. So we need to constantly think in terms of this here, based on past evidence, based on existing knowledge, what are the different components of a concept and how might we measure them? And the question we're asking when we think about the validity of a concept then is, does the question that I have asked reflect the full range of the concept? Does it actually measure what it sets out to? And we tend to use four criteria for this. When we talk about validity, and we'll work through an example of this in a moment, we tend to talk, we talk about face validity, construct and content validity, which are quite closely related, and then criterion validity. So face validity asks the question, does the measure make sense? If we look at it on inspection, um, is it grammatically correct? Is it understandable? Can, you know, can, it, can a typical respondent read that question and know what it means? But also, does it make sense to us? So if we're asking somebody, um, we'll, look in, we'll, look in, um, we'll look in a second at the example of coronavirus restriction compliance. So for a measure to be face valid in that sense means you know, if a person reads the question, does it actually refer to specifically um, compliance with health regulation measures with respect to coronavirus? Construct and content validity then deal with the extent to which a question measures theoretical, um, theoretical criteria. And criterion validity is something that's quite difficult to establish. And the example that's given in the book from Bachman and Schutt is that if we were trying to establish, uh, let's say, how much alcohol someone had consumed, uh, we were using a self-reported questionnaire. In that case, we could ask someone, you know, how many standard drinks did you have in the last um, in the last twenty-four hours, let's say, 
Um, a way to check the criterion validity of that then would be to perhaps uh, draw a blood sample and check their blood alcohol levels. It's very rare in the social sciences that we have questions that we can exert criterion validity on, but there are other ways to do it. We can ask um, other questions or we can take more direct measures as possible and we'll talk about some of those, uh, not this week, but next week. So to demonstrate these principles, and let's go back to the question that I posed to you by way of example last week, question of COVID restriction compliance. So let's assume the concept to be measured is compliance. Um, and again, if we were trying to conceptualize compliance, what might that actually mean? And you can probably think of kind of several components of that. It would be due to, you know, we, we, would know, we would need to know something about beliefs. We would need to know something about behaviors. We would also need to know something about attitudes. So someone could be behaviorally compliant, but might not necessarily believe in the validity of the rules. And so, you know, we might want to ask people questions about their the extent to which they agree with the rules, but also the extent to which they're practically compliant. And we might find that, you know, that there actually wasn't necessarily a correlation between strong levels of trust um, in the validity of the measures, but that there was a strong level of compliance. And again, that would be a, another sort of puzzle to work out. So let's imagine in this case, we're just asking one question. Five point scale, how compliant are you with mask wearing and social distancing? So if we're asking whether that measure is face valid, we're asking, does it make sense? Um, it's not perfect, but, you know, it's not totally far removed. Somebody can read that and, be, you know, we can be fairly confident that they'll understand what we're talking about. So how compliant are you with mask wearing and social distancing? It points pretty specifically toward COVID-19 regulations. Um, it doesn't say it, but, you know, if we're asking someone in 2020 about mask wearing and distancing, you know, it's probably, you know, it is probably a reasonable indicator in terms of that. Um, and, th and again, you know, if we start to think about you know, this process back here and the conceptualization process and we're thinking about sort of indicators, then um, mask wearing and social distancing are probably reasonable indicators of compliance. If you think about what other indicators might be, um, they could be things like limiting of social contacts. So we could ask someone, instead of asking about mask wearing and social distancing, we could ask if they're minimizing the number of people they see. We could ask them if they're shortening the length of time they spend in public places and so on. And these are all different possible indicators. So mask wearing and social distancing, you know, probably good indicators. But again, if you remember back to last week, the problem with this question is it's double barrel. It's asking about two separate things, mask wearing and social distancing. Okay, what about construct and content validity? So construct validity deals with the extent to which a measure fits theoretical requirements and content validity should asks or questions whether the measure captures the full range of the concept. So we need to think about, as we did previously with the face validity one, what do we actually mean, go, mean by compliance? And do these measures, do these indicators here, mask wearing, distancing, and the response categories, do they reflect that? So we said there's probably a lot more to compliance than this. Um, compliance can alternate. So people can be compliant in one setting, not compliant in another. Um, their belief in the legitimacy of the rules might vary, but they might be compliant anyway, regardless of that, for different reasons. Again, this question doesn't really tell us. You know, it doesn't get at the why of the compliance. We would use different questions for that, obviously. So in terms of construct and content validity, we think about the construct of compliance, the concept of compliance. Um, the indicators that we're using here, this question, sorry, these response options, this question, it's probably not fully construct or content valid. Criterion validity then would be difficult to establish with a concept like this. So if we were trying to measure levels of COVID restriction compliance, um, you know, one sort of any, any, any way that we could establish this would be highly unethical. So we could, you know, follow somebody around covertly afterwards and observe and see if they're wearing their mask or distancing. Um, that would be sort of a crude form of criterion validity. We could do other things. We could look at their phone records. Um, in case you weren't aware, un un unless you've specifically made the settings yourself, your phone is gathering uh, records of your movement. You can look at this back through, back through Google Maps. You can find it in your iPhone log. So these are all things that are highly unethical. Uh, we would never do them. So criterion validity with um, social concepts like this is very, very difficult to establish. The second thing we need to establish then with any set of measures is um, whether they are reliable. And as with... As with validity, reliability tends to be assessed on four dimensions, what we call test-retest, alternate forms, inter-rater, 
And the final one is specific. Internal consistency is specific to measures that use multiple questions to get at the same concept. I've got an example of this in a couple of slides time that I'll show you. So reliability simply asks, is the instrument consistent across different situations or scenarios? So is the question stable? And we're going to deal with the same question. So again, when we're talking about validity and reliability, in this sense, we're just talking about this question. We're talking about the question to measure COVID compliance. So test retest reliability deals with the extent to which a measure produces comparable, comparable or similar results on re-administration. Alternate forms reliability asks whether, whether different measures of the same concept produce the same results. Interrater reliability is about whether different interviewers or assessors produce the same results for the same individuals or similar. We'll refer back to the Kinsey example for this in a moment because um, the recording on the Kinsey scale is a great example of inter-rater reliability. And we'll talk about internal consistency last. So as with any of these, it's probably best to demonstrate this practically, so we'll talk about it. So again, the concept to be measured is COVID restriction compliance. The question we're using is how compliant are you with mask wearing and social distancing? And the response categories are on a five point scale from very compliant to never compliant. So is this question reliable? Again, validity is asking about the extent to which it captures the concept. Reliability is about the stability of the question. So on a day I went to the pub, I might score high. Um, on a shopping trip, I might score low. So test retest reliability then says if, let's imagine we're questioning the same individual at two different points in time. So let's say we ask somebody on a Monday and we ask them on a Saturday. Um, on a Monday, they went on a shopping trip and on a Saturday, they went to the pub. Now, the question is quite general. The question is asking about their overall or typical levels of COVID restriction compliance. And on the Monday, the person's level of compliance on the shopping trip might be low. They might have sort of flouted distancing guidelines or they might not. Or they might have been more compliant. It's easier to be compliant on a shopping trip because you've got a little bit more space in theory. And perhaps on a Saturday when they went to the pub, they weren't. Maybe they took off their mask to have a drink, left it off while they went to the toilet, didn't wash their hands and so on. So if we were trying to capture with this question um, whether it's a reliable measure of restriction compliance, on test-retest reliability, we would find that perhaps it isn't. And this is because assuming that the person's sort of average level of compliance remains the same, we would get different indicators of that compliance depending on the day we asked it. How we could fix this perhaps would be with more specific questioning. We could think, thinking back to the last four weeks, how compliant are you with mask wearing? That might increase the reliability of it. We could ask them to refer to a specific instance. We could say, thinking of your last public outing, your last trip to the pub and so on. So the problem is it doesn't get quite get at the, the underlying issue of compliance in general. Um, so it could vary depending on, depending on the time at which it's asked. So this test retest reliability is a way of establishing whether question is reliable, whether it would produce the same measure um, or comparable results, sorry, uh, at different times or different points of re-administration. You'll find as we go through this that a lot of these, a lot of these things sort of controlling for validity and reliability, a lot of it is to do with the, a lot of it is to do with the construction of the question. Is the question phrased unambiguously? Is the frame of reference appropriate? But also do the answer categories, the response categories, that's these, these options here, do they get at the full range um, of possible options. So let's imagine that we ask this question a different way. So this is uh, an, an different way of assessing reliability, which we call alternate forms. Alternate forms of reliability then is when we take a similar measure of the same concept, we ask both questions and then assuming that they are both measuring the same underlying concept, both answers should be relatively, relatively similar. So let's say we go, we ask them about thinking of your last trip to a public space, shopping center, pub or restaurant. How compliant were you with mask wearing and social distancing? So again, the theory behind this is that if this is indeed a reliable measure of typical restriction compliance, then it shouldn't really be affected by whether we ask about a specific trip or about general compliance. So in the alternate forms example, we ask the same question a different way assuming that the measure is reliable, either the first or the second, I should score equally or close on both, on both forms. Um, if I'm not scoring, so let's say if um, in the first one, because the frame of reference is unclear, I say that I'm you know, rarely compliant. But on the second one, 
I'd say very compliant because now I'm being specifically asked about a shopping centre, pub or restaurant. Then we have an issue with the alternate forms of liability of the question. Again, assuming it's capturing the same concept. Now, you could make the argument that this question is quite a different question. It's probably capturing something else. It's not perhaps comparable to this one in terms of the frame of reference, and that's a fair point. So this happens you know, quite often in survey research with, um, with different concepts. It's a useful test uh, of, for things like uh, difficult questions with social desirability bias built in, um, about asking people about things like prejudicial attitudes. We would tend to try to, you know, we, 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 we would try within that to engineer for alternate forms of liability by asking some of, you know, similar or related questions or questions about related behaviors or attitudes to try and get it, get a little bit closer at. Um, at the underlying phenomenon. Um, Inter-rater reliability then is um, the example, a good example that we looked at in part one of this was in the Kinsey studies. So in the Kinsey studies, what the researchers did there was um, they used raters uh, to score a person's sexual orientation. So based on the histories that the researchers took of all the participants in the Kinsey studies, they postcoded the individuals on the, on the Kinsey scale from zero to eight, sorry, from, um, they, sorry, they postcoded them on the eight point scale, uh, zero to six um, or an X. And so inter-rater reliability then deals with the extent to which different researchers will produce consistent results for similar individuals. If we think of inter-rater reliability in the context of COVID-19 restriction or regulation compliance, then one thing that we could do here that we could think of is to imagine that instead of giving people a question we were training researchers and we were asking researchers to observe individuals and to rate their compliance. So instead of, you know, instead of giving people a question to ask in self-reporting, we asked researchers um, to record their perceived level of compliance by observing members of the public in different settings. So if we gave them a set of instructions, let's say, um, you know, to look at the person and to score them on things like, you know, whether they've kept distance, whether they're wearing a mask on their hand hygiene and so on, and let's say we also instruct them to follow the person over a five minute period. Then the extent to which the measures that those people, that those researchers give uh, of, of, a, of an individual's COVID restriction compliance, these are inter-rater reliable only to the extent that um, two researchers will observe the same person and give the same score. So let's say we have two researchers observing the same person and they're using the set, the set of criteria that I just outlined. And let's say the first rater um, scores the person on uh, scores the person a five because they've just looked at their mask and they're not wearing a mask. But let's say the second rater then looks at them and they don't notice that the person isn't wearing a mask, but they do see that they are uh, maintaining consistent distance. They might score them. They might score them up here as somewhat compliant. We now have a question of inter-rater reliability or an issue with inter-rater reliability because the person they're observing hasn't changed, they're the same, the subject is the same. It's the raters that are giving a different opinion. So inter-rater reliability is present when two raters, um, or two instruments in the case, uh, if, we're using, if we're using a questionnaire, um, the extent to which they give similar results um, for an identical individual. So this was an issue in the Kinsey studies, as I said, because it relied on um, training researchers consistently uh, so that they understood what were the given or what were the key indicators um, what were the key indicators that, that needed to be recorded. Internal consistency then is the extent to which multiple components of an index make sense together. An example here is uh, the GHQ, the General Health Questionnaire, and this is often used as a measure of mental well-being. Um, there are different versions of the GHQ um, that use sort of either more or less questions. There's a more simplified version, there's also a more elaborate version. And instead of asking someone, you know, how let's imagine a very crude way of putting this question is, you know, asking someone how they feel and we could give them a choice like happy or sad. Obviously, that's a terrible question um, because well-being, again, is composed of multi multiple different components. So let's say we ask people about 12 of these components on the GHQ 12 form. We ask them about concentration levels, uh, sleep, feelings of self-worth, strain and so on, other things like their confidence and their self-worth and happiness. So all of these questions together, the idea behind a scale is that instead of measuring well-being using a single question, we use multiple items to capture the same concept. And then what we would do then is typically we would add someone's scores together on all these 12, or we would average them and we get one 
measure of subjective well-being. Now, the extent to which we can say that these, this scale, and again, these 12 questions form a scale, the extent to which these together um, reflect or capture the same underlying concept is a question of internal consistency. So if the scale is reliable, if it's internally consistent, then all of these questions are related to the concept of well-being and they all capture the same thing. So that's what we try to establish when we talk about internal consistency. Um, do all these questions relate to the same concept? And in technical terms, we'll be looking at this in subsequent weeks, we will also be asking, are they correlated? So, you know, a scale is only reliable to the extent that the items are correlated with each other. This is often referred to as inter-item correlation as well. Um, and the way that we assess this formally is by looking at the correlation between sort of different um, combinations of different items. So if you were imagining um, back to our example of COVID restriction compliance, then a scale to measure that might be where we ask question one, an individual to rate their compliance um, in public, at home, um, in public parks, in pubs and restaurants and so on. And then we would add those compliance scores together. Let's say we use four items to get an aggregate score. And then that scale would be our measure of compliance rather than just this one question over here. So validity and reliability are crucially important means of assessing uh, the quality of survey questions. There are sort of technical ways, and again, reliability tends to be assessed in a more technical sense. Uh, there are specific tests of reliability that we can use, and there are ways that we can engineer reliability tests into a questionnaire that make it a little bit more easy to, to capture. Validity then is principally um, a job, or, or is principally controlled for at the design stage. And how do we ensure a measure is valid? We do this by paying close attention to the conceptualization process to make sure we're drawing on you know, extensive or the existing state of knowledge about the concept, but also making sure that the questions we use and the measures we use also reflect the full meaning of the concept. So we will continue on Monday with some further examples of this, and we will be talking more about validity and reliability next week when uh, we get to survey research.